What is the difference between animate matter, a living organism, and inanimate matter of the equivalent complexity? So what's the difference between a live mouse and a recently deceased mouse? They're both made of the same atoms and molecules combined in the same complex structure, but in one case it's alive, in one case it's dead. What is that difference? It's not magic, it's a spark of life issue that, you know, vitalism that scientists used to think 200 years ago. Well, that's, we know that's not the case. Mm. You know, we should be able to explain life. Phylogists, I don't know if they, they, they like this or not, but we should be able to explain biology using the laws of physics and chemistry. Because what else is there? Yeah. It just <laughs> may be that, it just may be that those laws of physics and chemistry that explain life, we have yet to properly understand but it can't what else could it be first of all on, on the issue of confusion i have to say there's this famous quote by one of the founding fathers of quantum mechanics niels bohr he says if you're not confused by quantum mechanics then clearly you haven't understood it <laughs> <laughs> you're meant to be confused doctor's kitchen recipes health lifestyle so jim thank you so much for jumping on the podcast today um as you might know we generally talk about nutrition and food and medicine and, and lifestyle and stuff. But I was fascinated by the work that you've done with uh, Professor John Joe um, and your wider work as well on life scientific and stuff. So I just had to get you on the pod. And I thought I knew a bit about physics until I read your book and I realized <laughs> how complicated it is. The point of the book is to help you understand, yeah. not to understand less. <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was really well written and and, oh, and, and it's it piqued my my interest even more so in the subject and I definitely want to read around it and I've watched some of your lectures as well um, but I thought we could start by talking a bit about um, yourself and, and how you got interested in, in physics and, and mm. how it sort of led you to this meandering path and, and being such an excellent science communicator. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I fell in love with physics in my early teens, I guess, you know, about the age of 13 or 14. I still wanted to play professional football. I still wanted to be a rock star and all that, but, you know, the, the normal. Um, but, um, yeah, I sort of realised that, you know, the big questions that, you know, lots of lots of us think about, you know, laying down, at, looking up at the night sky, does, does, does the universe go on forever? What are stars made of? What, what's inside an atom? You know? all those big, big questions. And I realized that physics was a subject I had to study if I wanted to get answers. And I happened to be, you know, I was good at maths, good at the sort of logical problem solving. And for me, physics was so much easier than the other sciences. It was easier than chemistry and biology because you didn't have to remember so much stuff. <laughs> In physics, it was like puzzle solving, you know? So, so, cause I, I was, I just, I couldn't, I, I was bad at history cause I couldn't remember dates and names. Same with, with, with chemistry biology. So from that point, from about 13 or 14, that's it. I wanted to do physics and, and that's where my path has taken me. So the university study physics and then as a, a career in the subject ever since. Brilliant, brilliant. And you, you grew up in uh, Baghdad, is that is that correct? Yes, yes. Well, my, my, my mum's English, my dad's uh, from Iraq. So he, mm. he'd been studying over in the UK in the 50s, studying engineering where he met my mum, married went back to Iraq because he was in uh, as an engineer in the Iraqi Air Force. So I was born in Baghdad. We'd come over to, to the UK every two or three years summer holiday to visit my maternal grandparents. Um, but, you know, English was my sort of first language. We spoke English at home, but I spoke Arabic because I went to school in Iraq until the age of 16 before we finally came over and settled permanently in the UK. Amazing. And you already had some connections there, obviously, and you're a lead supporter as well, I hear. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, tell you what, every kid in Iraq and probably every kid in every country in the world has a favourite English football team. So yeah. clearly growing up in Iraq in the 60s and 70s, Leeds was the team to support. And unfortunately, despite their fortunes sort of plummeting, I've just carried on loyal to them ever since. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I remember I grew up uh, supporting Manchester United, like a typical fair weather supporter, uh, being a Londoner. Yeah. Uh, of course, I supported Manchester United. <laughs> and now I'm just, uh, I just watch the sport. Um, but yeah, no, it's, right. it's interesting how everyone <laughs> across the world has got a European football team that they just absolutely love. One, oh, what, this wonderful story. I had a, a friend of mine in Iraq. He, we lived the last few years outside of Baghdad, it's the south of Baghdad in a small He'd only been to Baghdad once in his life. Um, so he'd never, certainly never traveled outside of Iraq. And yet he was a big fan of Preston North End. <laughs> He'd seen them on some match of the day rerun, which was shown on Iraqi TV. And, and, and that was it, it was Preston North End. You could name all their players. <laughs> That's amazing. That's so good. <laughs> 
So um, the, the book uh, that you wrote, I think it was about five years ago now, um, Life on the Edge. Um, yes. Well, maybe we could start really at the title and in explaining what we mean by the title. I think everyone's come across, you know, living on the edge and stuff and, and, and the, the play on words there. But what do, you, what do you guys mean by life on the edge? Right. Well, w what we mean is something quite specific, which uh, is not obvious just from the title. Um, so the idea is in, in, in 20th century science, you know, the, the in, certainly in physics, there's this theory of quantum mechanics, which is, you know, people will have heard of and it's just very, very clever and very weird and very confusing. And it's the theory that describes how atoms behave and the subatomic particles, the Large Hadron Collider and so on. But it's not a theory that describes our everyday world around us. Um, uh, and so it's, it's very specific to the microscopic realm. As that theory was developed in the 1920s, 1930s, at the same time, biology was going through a revolution because that's when genetics started and molecular biology. And at the time there was the thinking that, well, molecular biology, let's talk about molecules. They're pretty tiny, right? You know, they're, they're sort of collections of atoms. Surely you need this new quantum theory to explain molecular biology. And it turned out they didn't need it. Uh, and so the two just areas of science developed independently. It's only in recent years that we've discovered there are these certain things, mechanisms that go on inside living cells down at the scale of molecules and atoms that we seem to need the, the, the weird, the counterintuitive rules of quantum physics to explain them. Uh, and, and that led to this, this new field, which this book is about quantum biology. So when we talk about life on the edge, we mean life on the edge of the boundary between normal biology, uh, uh, molecular biology that doesn't need any weirdness and some of these counterintuitive aspects of the quantum world. It's, it's, it, it, you know, we asked the question, could, could life exist even without a helping hand from quantum mechanics? And, and so am I right in saying that you've got your, your classical systems, things in the, in the macroscopic level, and then you have your, your quantum systems where you have it at a very, very minute scale. Is that, is that right, that those two definitions? Absolutely. Um, uh, but of course, the big question is, where's the boundary? Yeah. You know, if you get smaller and smaller, <laughs> right, if you get smaller <laughs> and smaller. So, you know, every day, you know, the, the, the physics that we do at school, you know, um, springs and pendulums and balls rolling down slopes and all that business all the stuff we see around us even up to the very large sending rockets to the moon and mars all of that requires classical physics the physics of isaac newton basically mm. oh, later extended with a helping hand from people like albert einstein of course but all of that is still called classical physics you get smaller but then you say what do you mean by smaller down to the size of a pinhead no smaller down to the size of um a, a, a living a human cell no even smaller you get to the point where we, we, we're talking about the building blocks of life, mm -hmm. you know, DNA, um, or even, you know, um, uh, viruses, you know, since uh, viruses seem to be in the news <laughs> these days, they are at a scale where if they weren't living organisms, if they were just objects in the physics lab, we'd be thinking, right, we've got to use the rules of quantum mechanics to explain how they move, how they interact with each other, what their structure is like. But because they're part of biology, we've sort of ignored quantum mechanics historically for the for those reasons that biologists don't learn quantum mechanics and physicists don't learn biology. Um, but it's it's that boundary is very fuzzy. Mm. It's, 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 it's down at what's called the nanoscale. You know, we talk about things like nanotechnology, which is at the size of molecular structures, at the size gotcha. of the double helix of DNA, may or may not have some interaction with the quantum world and we feel it should. Gotcha, so you, you have your macroscopic uh, classical sort of systems and then you have, would it be fair to say it's like subatomic level? Is that the sort of yeah, realm? Yeah, yeah. Atoms, atoms and below. So, gotcha. so my, my, my background is, is, is in nuclear physics, which is the, the nucleus of the atom, which is even smaller. And that's really the playground of quantum mechanics. <laughs> Gotcha. So before we, we look at how this might, may have an effect in, in biology, um, could you give us some idea of some of the weird things that happen down at that quantum level that have been verified by some experimental data? Yeah, I mean, it, some of it sounds so crazy that you know, the, the non-scientists say, I'll oh, come off it. Sure, that, go, go back and check your sums. You know, go back and do that experiment because this, this is silly. <laughs> 
we'd love to be able to find out what, why or how it's silly, but we've had quantum mechanics for a for hundred years now. In fact, the experiments that confirmed it go back even before the 1920s. Um, it started off by people doing experiments with atoms. They could start to do these very, very refined experiments looking at the, the, the structure of atoms. They discovered things like X-rays and radioactivity and so on that they couldn't explain with the theories that they had at the time. And then people like Einstein and others will come out with ideas saying, well, actually, if you explain it this way, look, the, the, the sums you get from your calculations for the, the, your equations on, on paper match the results that you get in the experiments lab. So clearly we we're on the right tracks here, but no one understood how or why. And it wasn't until the mid late 1920s that this whole new edifice called quantum mechanics was finally complete. It does describe, it says that once you get down to this subatomic level, you can't talk about objects being, you know, your atoms bumping into each other, being like tiny balls bumping into each other. Everything starts to get a bit fuzzy, a bit hazy, a bit probabilistic. You can't say, you know, the, 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 the typical subatomic particles, the electron, right? It's a tiny part that all zips around the outside of atoms. You can't say an electron is a tiny, tiny particle. Sometimes it behaves like a cloud, like a spread out entity. And how it behaves, this is even more weird, how it behaves depends on how you look at it. So if you, if you design an experiment to find out where an electron is, say you've got, let's say you've got an electron in a box, don't, don't worry about how, how you capture an electron and stick it in a box and after all it's too tiny to see anyway, but Ideally, you have an electron in a box. If you design some experiment to work out where it is, you could. You could pinpoint it at an exact location. But equally, you could design experiment to work out how much energy the electron has. And you can define its energy very, very precisely. But if you do that, suddenly it spreads out to fill the whole box. It's not in a particular location. So you may have something called Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Uh, which is sort of, it's a, it's a term that's entered popular culture. Most people, are, and, un, uh, unless they're sort of aficionados, practitioners of quantum mechanics, won't know what it means. But it simply means you can't pinpoint where an electron is and work out what its energy is at the same time, or work out how fast it's going at the same time. So everything at the quantum level, at the subatomic level, is a bit fuzzy, it's uncertain, it's, it's not fixed and, and precise. And that's inherent in the very nature of that the subatomic world. It's not because we don't know how to measure it or because our instruments are too clumsy and it's too tiny to, 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 to hold in place. That's really what the world is like there. But it does mean that particles, because they're spread out, you can actually talk about an electron or, or an atom being in two places at the same time. You don't see it in two places at the same time. Well, if you look, you see it in one place or the other. But before you look, you can do other experiments which confirm that it has to be in both locations at once. And that culminated in this famous um, uh, idea by the, the Austrian physicist Erwin Schrodinger. Um, uh, he, and so, so the Schro Schrodinger's cat's paradox is, is famous. He said, look, if you, cats are made of atoms, right? And if, if atoms, you know, he's one of the founders of quantum mechanics, yet even he himself had doubts and sleepless nights. Like, how, how the hell can it be like this? He said, stick a cat in a box, cats are made of atoms. And, you know, if that cat could be half dead and half alive. So if you, if you, if you put it, some poison in, which may or may not have been released into the box within an hour, this, this, by the way, this experiment was never carried out. It was just, just, just a thought experiment. Um, he said, common sense would tell us that until you open the box, either the cat has been killed by the poison or the poison hasn't been released yet and the cat is alive. It's just that we don't know whether the cat is dead or alive. He said, no, but if, the, if you apply the rules of, strict rules of quantum mechanics, that tells us the cat is both dead and alive at the same time. It's in a fuzzy in-between state until you open the box and look to see what, and then you'll see it one way. So it's sort of, that fuzziness doesn't disappear until we open the box. So it's ideas like that, which still give, even give quantum physicists like me headaches. <laughs> like how can the world be like that? And yet, you know, we've, we've, we've had to live with it, you know, and uh, 
you know, then, then you've got particles very far apart from each other instantaneously communicating. That's called quantum entanglement. Mm -hmm. That was so weird that even Einstein didn't believe it. You know, he said, ah, that, that can't be, that can't be right. You know, go back and think about it again. But it turns out, you know, these things go on in the quantum world and we have ample evidence that they are true. In fact, the reason the sun shines is thanks to quantum mechanics because in the sun, hydrogen atoms are fusing together to make helium. The only way they can stick together is if they use these weird rules of quantum mechanics of being spread out objects. And so without quantum mechanics, we wouldn't be here because there would be no sun to sustain life on earth. So it's true, Yeah, it made sense. Yeah, yeah. And one of those perplexing things that you talk about, and I've seen uh, as well in, in the past, is um, the impact of measurement and the measurement effect, I think it's called where if you try, it's, it's almost like opening the, the box. Mm. The only way you can tell whether it's in one place or not is, is having a look inside. But when you do have a look inside, you're in some way influencing the outcome of the experiment. And, and that was demonstrated in the, in the slit experiment as well. Is that, is that Yes, right? that's right. Yes, the, the measurement problem. Well, I mean, the, the, the problem is this. We say you can't, the cat is not dead or alive until you open the box and look. But, you know, who are you? Do you have to have a PhD to do that? Do you have to be wearing a white lab coat? Can anyone look? Could another cat look? And if that's the case, why couldn't the cat in the box decide for itself? What happens if you put Erwin Schrodinger in a box with some poison, see how he likes it, right? Do you then open the box and he says, oh, thank goodness for that. I was feeling in a bit of a dead and alive state until you opened the box and forced me to be alive. So the measurement problem comes with these philosophical issues that we're only now starting to, to, to appreciate exactly what, what is going on. And it's still a work in progress, even after a hundred years of quantum mechanics. Okay, so, so listeners are probably, you know, at the same- I've turned off my uh, no, 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 I'm sure they have. But they're probably at the same sort of level of confusion as me. Um, and and I, it's, it's a very confusing topic and you, mm. your book does a fantastic way of, of, of definitely taking us through that journey historically as well. So um, you're, you're at the quantum level, which is essentially what everything is made up of. Everything is mm. uh, you know, made up of atoms stuck together. You get to the classical level where those weird effects don't uh, uh, occur. So entanglement, um, being in a couple of places at once, et cetera. How can we explain why that doesn't happen at the macro level when it happens at the micro level, given that everything is mm. made up of micro stuff? Right, well, the... Uh... First of all, on, on the issue of confusion, I have to say there's this famous quote by one of the founding fathers of quantum mechanics, Niels Bohr. He mm -hmm. says, uh, if you're not confused by quantum mechanics, then clearly you haven't understood it. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> you're meant to be confused, right? You know, it's, 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 so don't feel, oh, no, it's, no, that doesn't make sense. I'm, I'm not clever enough. No, 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 no. Clearly, you know, you are clever enough because you've realized that it is confusing. Um, yeah, so why, why don't those quantum effects persist when you get large objects? Well, it's to do with uh, uh, the number of, of particle, the number of constituents, you know, the, the building blocks that make up something. When you talk about individual atoms or individual particles, they can very easily express their quantumness. They can be wavy, they can be probabilistic, they can be in two places at once and fuzzy. You build more and more and more together and all their fuzziness combines and cancels out and you get some overall averaging, some smearing out of their effects. So you don't see this fuzziness when you're talking about a ball, say. Um, a ball, uh, you know, football, tennis ball or whatever, is made of, of trillions of building blocks of atoms. And so all of them working together don't, you know, if you think about, um, waves on the surface of the ocean if you're zoomed out and you look at the, the ripples on the ocean well the ocean might look smooth from a very from from a, a high altitude mm -hmm. but you get closer you can see the waves and they're, they're behaving normally but if you were to get down to the level of water molecules they're all jiggling about all over the place mm -hmm. so the quantum effects are a bit like that once you zoom out and get large number of particles it washes out all those effects you just don't get to see them anymore okay Okay, so I, I'm sort of understanding, I'm piecing things together. How does quantum and the, the, um, the, the, the quantum system uh, relate to biology? Uh, maybe we can use an example. Um, you used the example of photosynthesis. We've already talked about the sun, for example. 
how do we use quantum uh, mechanics to to explain the process of photosynthesis? Well, I mean, this is to some extent still a slightly controversial subject, but you know, photosynthesis, the, you know, the, the way that plants and, and bacteria, in fact, use sunlight and convert it into chemical energy to, to, to sustain their life is a really complex process. It's a, it's a biochemical process with multiple stages and lots of things happening. But it's been observed that the, the very earliest stage, the first step in photosynthesis, which is the sort of chlorophyll molecules capturing sunlight, a particle of light called a photon, and delivering it to the reaction center in the cell. So that bundle, that lump of energy, of light energy, is, can then be converted into chemical energy. It can you know, split molecules and make new ones and so on. So it's basically it's using it uh, to sustain life. The delivery of that photon from the, the, the moment it's captured to the reaction center seems to be very efficient, far more efficient than you might expect. You'd think, because it's got to work its way through a forest of molecules inside the cell, that it would just bump around like a, like a ball in a pinball machine. You know, it could go anywhere. Uh, it, it, it just randomly, chances are, uh, it, it'll, it'll, it, it'll not end up where it's supposed to end up. If you think about the game, what's that? What's that? I'm trying to think of the, the, the afternoon quiz game. I'm not, but I watched uh, uh, daytime TV where they, <laughs> where, where they, uh, they drop the counters down. Um, oh, uh, pointless. No, no, not pointless. No, 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 no nothing to <laughs> do with that. They drop the counters down. They drop the, drop the counters down and they sort of go down these pegs and then they land somewhere and then they f push other, um, you know, coins, you know, discs. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. It's, shelf like, and it's like an off. arcade game. That's like that. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, those counters, you say, right, I'm going to do it in section three because you hope you want it to land in a certain place. Well, it, it, it may not because it's randomly bouncing off these pegs. It might land somewhere else. That's what happens to this. I'm using an analogy from daytime TV quiz shows <laughs> to describe quantum mechanics. Oh, my, that's my career is over. <laughs> um, it, it, and yet that photon always almost unerringly reaches its destination. And it was discovered that what looks like is happening is that it's it's behaving quantum mechanically. Now, you mentioned the, the, the two slit experiment just now. Mm. We haven't talked about that. The basic idea is you send a particle through a screen with two slits. Um, it, it should go through one slit or the other if it's going to get through. Um, and then it hits a, a, back, a screen on the back. But what happens because it's a quantum particle, it seems to be able to go through both slits at once, like the cat being dead and alive at the same time. And, and, and you see what happens there, it leads to what's called an interference pattern, a bit like waves going through slits, you get light and dark fringes. Well, this photon of light seems to do the same thing. It seems to follow multiple routes simultaneously in, in just such a way that the overall average is always hitting its destination and, uh, and it never goes astray because quantum mechanics is helping it. I know I've not given this explanation justice, but I, any more than that would make it even more confusing. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, no, I, I understand that because um, th there's an, another uh, section where you talk about hereditary, uh, uh, um, uh, heredity. So, um, you know, how it's possible that uh, we can replicate genes with such accuracy when mm -hmm. if you were to look at randomness, there should be much more in terms of errors, rate copying errors, then, then there should be. So perhaps quantum mechanics has an impact on, on that as well, on replication. Yes, it's possible. I mean, that's something we're looking at at, at the moment. In fact, what, what we're looking at now with, with my research group is that say, okay, well, let's say, you know, life has evolved the ability to be very accurate in replication. You know, there are enzymes in the cell, you know, pro, large molecules, proteins, that are, are, are the molecular machines that make sure that no mistakes take place. Mm. We said, but what if a mistake does take place and it goes through? How could that mistake happen? Could quantum mechanics play a role? So in fact, we, we, we published a paper earlier this year showing that in the double helix structure of DNA, the, the, you know, the, the twisted ladder, um, there are particles that hold the, the two strands of the DNA together. Um, 
they're called hydrogen bonds. They're basically mm -hmm. atoms of hydrogen. Uh, and they can behave quantum mechanically. They can jump from one strand to the other in, in accordance with the rules of quantum mechanics. That happens very rarely, but if it does, and then, you know, because what happens with replication of DNA is the two double helix strands unwind or, or unzipped, they're unzipped by an enzyme and then they're separated and then each one makes another copy of itself. And, you know, if, if everything's working fine, it makes an exact replica of the partner that it used to be linked to. But if this hydrogen atom jumps from one strand to the other just before the two unzip, then you get this, this chemical bond in the wrong place. And when it starts to make a copy of itself, it doesn't make an identical copy to what happened before. So it leads to a mutation. Uh, and so that's the question we're asking now. You know, we know mutations happen and thank goodness mutations, we don't want the COVID-19 uh, virus to, to mutate, that's a bad thing. But actually, if there was no mutation at all, there'd be no evolution because we'd never change. Mm, mm. Um, and, and so we know mutations happen all the time. The question we're asking now is, could sometimes, could mutations take place because of quantum mechanics, allowing this particle, this atom to jump from one place to another? We try and do all these very sophisticated computer models to try and see what are the chances of this happening? And if it does, is it gonna get corrected? Is it gonna get, is that an error that's gonna get picked up? Oh no, you don't, you're in the wrong place. Or does it just go through the process and then you know, become a mutation further down the or, line. Or to add a, another dimension, would it be something that might be advantageous to the, the host if there was a mutation that actually provided some sort of uh, you know, physical uh, phenotypic advantage? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, we talk about the coronavirus mutating and that's a bad thing. Well, for the virus itself, it's a good thing, you know, survival of the fittest. And so the reason a mutation becomes, you know, like we talk about the Delta uh, a variant of, of, of the COVID virus uh, spreading, that's because that mutation is better at, at um, being transmitted from, from one person to another. So that was because of a mutation. You know, it didn't know if I, if I mutate this way, that's gonna give me advantage. Come on guys, let's all mutate. It just happened randomly by accident. And then mm. that new mutation suddenly discovered that it was more successful at transmitting. So it becomes the, 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 the dominant type. So mutations, if they're not advantageous, they won't survive. They're mm. not the fittest to survive. The, the ones that do survive are the ones that do infer some sort of advantage on, 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 their, on their host organism. Yeah, and it's always like this combination of like um, Lamarckian theory and Darwinianism. So, uh, you know, the neo-Darwinianism. So where you have um, some advantages that are conferred to the host and some that are, are brought out. Um, but there's always, there, there seems to be like a thread um, of heredity that is being potentially uh, um, processed by quantum uh, mechanics. Is, is that... It, it's possible, yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know that mutations uh, uh, take place for all sorts of reasons, you know, just ionizing radiation that we you know that is bombarding all life in the biosphere constantly. Um, if that radiation, you know, hits a cell, it can damage the DNA and that can lead to a mutation. And, and as you said earlier, you know, copying errors take place. Mm -hmm. it, it's not, you know, the fidelity is not 100% all the time. So there are reasons ways why mutations take place all the time. The question we're asking is this quantum effect, this so-called quantum tunneling of this hydrogen atom from one DNA strand to the other, um, is it important? We think it takes place. The question is, is it in the noise or does it really make up a, a significant um, probability of happening uh, you know, as part of other forms of mutation? If so, well, it's interesting to know. Maybe we could do something about it. You know, maybe yeah. it could be controlled in some way. Yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, I'm not referring to some of the conspiracy theories that came out last year on the, the height of the um, uh, coronavirus with mm. 5G and, and, and all that kind of stuff. But um, are, are there any uh, concerns with urban uh, electric magnetic fields and that having an impact on people's health at all? Is that something that you've come across uh, as... I, I've come across it. I've come mm. across it, but it's not something that you know. The sums simply don't add up. Mm. Uh, it, 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 
the numbers, you know, it's just impossible for that to have a major effect on, on, on the cellular environment. We do know that, you know, there are, um, there, there are creatures, you know, um, animals that can sense the Earth's magnetic field and mm. they use that for, for navigation, you know, certain birds when they migrate, certain insects, certain marine mammals. So we know that the Earth's magnetic field can have some influence on the chemistry inside living organisms. And that, even that is not very well understood, even though it's been known for a few decades. But then, and, and so we know that electromagnetic fields can have an influence. After all, you know, you stick a body in an MRI scanner, that's, in, that's a very powerful magnetic field that affects mm. the body, otherwise you wouldn't get, get an image. Um, but the notion that it can lead to mutations that simply doesn't make logical sense because it would have to be able to be so focused. You can't cause a mutation. You can damage a cell. You know, if you if you if you sit inside a very powerful magnetic field, then that's that could be dangerous. Um, but it's not going to cause individual particles to to to, to jump from one place to another or, mm. or mutate. And certainly, sitting in you know sort of. I know that people are still thinking, looking at, you know, effects of overuse of mobile phones and things mm. like that, but I, I've not seen any, any numbers, any mm -hmm. serious modeling calculations where someone said, yep, that's a strong enough magnetic field to actually cause harm. Okay. Um, that, that's, that's great to know as well, because I, 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 I'm constantly asked about it, but I don't think uh, I've ever come across anything definitive that suggests that utilising those devices or being, or being uh, exposed to background um, urban electromagnetic fields have a detrimental effect. Um, talking about electromagnetic fields, uh, I, I guess we should, we should talk about human consciousness. <laughs> Uh, and uh, again, yet another frustrating field of, of what, how, how on earth are, is it that we are self-aware, that we uh, can formalize thoughts? Um, where, where are we up to at, at this point? Where are we up to? We, we still find consciousness mysterious. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, certainly my, my colleague, um, John Joe McFadden, who's a molecular geneticist at Surrey, so you had him on, on the podcast last year. Uh, he's, in fact, he's published recently uh, a couple of papers on the effects of, uh, uh, of the electromagnetic field of the brain. Mm -hmm. you, know, the, you know, our brain works by firing neurons. These are electrical signals. And therefore, by definition, there's an electromagnetic field associated with the brain. Whether or not that's connected to consciousness is a, is a hugely speculative area. I mean, a lot of people have, have, have suggested, well, you know, quantum mechanics, maybe, maybe the consciousness is quantum. And I can see why that is an attractive proposition. But my answer is always the same. Look, quantum mechanics is mysterious and we don't understand it. Consciousness is mysterious and we don't understand it. That does not mean the two have to be connected to each other. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and I think you know, where the, the advances that are being made in consci consciousness studies are by people working in neuroscience, artificial intelligence, uh, there's a there's a, a good friend of mine, a colleague of mine at Sussex University, um, uh, uh, who, who who is running a group. Uh, Anil Seth, his name is, and 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 Anil's running this um, group on, in neuroscience, studying the nature of consciousness. And I think we're starting to to make some some progress in understanding what is the meaning of self. You know, what it, mm. it, we we don't think consciousness is something other than what's in the brain. It's not like you know you have your gray matter, it's just, just uh, you know, chemistry, and then you sprinkle pixie dust and suddenly you become self-aware. Mm. Um, and, you know, and I'm not a religious person, so I don't believe in, you know, mind-body problem. I don't think there's a soul or something like that, a seat of consciousness. It's just a problem that has, has been going for so long. You know, philosophers are still asking the question about the nature of free will. Are we just machines, you know, or, or do we have the ability to make decisions? Of course, we feel as though we have decisions, that, you know, we can make decisions freely ourselves. But is it all just is it all just atoms bumping into each other at the end of the day? And if it isn't, what else is it? Yeah. Uh, you know, what is beyond just the, you know, we're, we're more than just complicated computers. We know that. So what is the difference? What is the difference between... Uh, animate matter, a living organism, and inanimate matter, 
of the equivalent complexity. And so what's the difference between a live mouse and a recently deceased mouse? They're both made of the same atoms and molecules, you know, combined in the same complex structure, but in one case it's alive, in one case it's dead. What is that difference? It's not magic, it is a spark of life issue that, you know, vitalism that scientists used to think uh, 200 years ago. Well, that's, we know that's not the case. Mm. You know, we should be able to explain life. Biologists, I don't know if they, they, they like this or not, but we should be able to explain biology using the laws of physics and chemistry. <laughs> because what else is there? Yeah. It just yeah. maybe that it just maybe those laws of physics and chemistry that explain life we have yet to properly understand. But it can't, what else could it be? Yeah. The, the, the way you, you've talked about it in the, in the book, and I've heard um, John Joe talk about it before, is you have all these billions of, of connections, like the World Wide Web, for example. Um, and just because you have all those connections doesn't necessarily give rise to life or, or thought or self-awareness. So how is that different to the fleshy bits that we have in our skull that, that emit energy that we can measure with EEGs? Like wh where is the, where is the, the difference there? Um, and, and can you measure sparks of consciousness? I mean, we, we know the difference mm. between asynchronous and synchronous firing when you measure EEGs and you, you can get people to do tasks and stuff, but um, is, is that the, the current theory around where consciousness uh, arises, that the, the energy is, is the production of, of, of those neurons firing? Yes, um, or, or the way they're con connected up in, uh, in neural nets. I mean, w w we don't think that uh, it, it should be possible to build a conscious mind out of something other than biological building blocks. Hmm. You know, a, a computer could be conscious. There's no, there's no um, reason, there's no laws of science that tell you it can't. It, 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 we still believe it is a matter of complexity, of emergence. At the moment, our, our, our best artificial intelligences can they can beat us at chess but that's mm. pretty sort of mechanistical you know if this then that sort of thing and they are starting to start you know um, the, the the very advanced AIs that were that are being developed today are starting to show signs of original sort of creativity in a sense they're able to, really? to yeah yeah they're, they're oh, able wow. to yeah you know to to, to to generate music to generate art to, to, fi to, to find patterns that you know, we find difficult to find, but it's still at a rudimentary level. We just, you know, my view is, this is what's called strong AI, I think, the idea that there's, there's no um, sort of hard and fast rule that says a machine couldn't one day think, be conscious, be self-aware. It's just that we're a very long way away from that because we don't think there's anything you know, whether it's energy, whether it's whether it's um, the the neural net connections of our neurons in, in the brain, whatever, it's so complex that 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 consciousness is an emergent feature of the brain. You know, we're conscious. A cat is less conscious. Um, um, uh, uh, an ant is less conscious. Uh, you know, consciousness isn't a switch that's on or off. It's it's a, it's a dimmer switch. You know, it can be made brighter or, or dimmer depending on the complexity of the structure of the brain, but how it emerges, what it, how it originates, that is something we still don't understand. That's still one of the big mysteries of science. Yeah, I, I understand um, that to an extent, actually. So the, the more neural connections you have, the more, the, the more firing you have, um, the more likely you are to have this uh, emergent ability to you know, create original thought. And that's why you have a hierarchy of animals and we can create rudimentary tools. We can create computers, not me personally, but, uh, you, you know, generally mm. well, that's, that's sort of the hierarchy of things. But given the way uh, technology is, is growing exponentially, I mean, you mentioned you have, we have computers that can beat us at chess. We also have those that can beat us at Go now, which is a far yes. more complicated game. And then, you know, it's going to get more and more over the next 100, 200 years. Just because you have more connections, does that suddenly mean that you're gonna that consciousness is going to develop, or does it require something else? Because I, the way I see it is that the more connection doesn't necessarily mean suddenly consciousness sparks. No, I I, I don't think consciousness will will spark. I, there, there isn't a point at which you can say this computer or this AI algorithm is now self-aware. Mm. 
uh, it's it's a very it's it's a it's a smooth transition. You know, the very early AIs that um, um, organizations like DeepMind that, mm. that developed the the AI that beat the best the world master at the Chinese game of Go, um, they started those AIs practicing them on 1980s Atari video games. Yeah, uh, yeah, and 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 that is wonderful. They the you know I did a TV documentary about this uh, two or three years ago. Uh, so I went and, and filmed there and was talking to them. Now this uh, the game Breakout, where you've got um, um, a brick wall at the top of the screen, and and with a paddle you're sort of bouncing the the ball that knocks away the bricks. Well, this AI, I mean, I'm, I'm, it figured out that if it aimed the ball at the corner, it could keep breaking, breaking, breaking it until it could get behind the wall yeah. and then it's bouncing up and down on the wall and it's much more efficient at removing it more quickly and once it did that by accident and it worked it learned that that was the way to do it and then every time you run it it would it would do that because it it's uh, you know that started to be but this is what's, what's called machine learning mm -hmm. it, it built into it that this is a more efficient way so that's a very first rudimentary step of seeing a problem finding a way of solving it and learning from that is that that trick wasn't programmed into the ai by a human the the human programmer just said there's a wall bounce this ball until you knock away all the bricks of the wall Re rewards for doing it more quickly <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> definitely so so and i think the, the consciousness is something that will gradually gradually emerge it's not that you get to a certain point and say well this is as far as we can go with complexity we, we need an extra ingredient now, the magic pixie dust, to make it self-aware, make it conscious. I don't think that is the case. I think that is something that just will gradually emerge when something becomes complex enough. Yeah, yeah. It's super interesting because uh, I, I think it, because it's perhaps my rudimentary mind, it's, it's almost like what, when, you, when you give a computer a task like a uh, breakout where you, you're trying to... Um, uh, break as many bricks as you can with uh, minimal touches on, on mm. the paddle, um, then the computer will reward itself for those behaviors. So, okay, when I hit it in this direction, I got 100 bricks versus two bricks if I did it another way. So, ergo, I'm going to carry on doing that because you've given it a task to complete. And yeah. the same thing with, you know, games and, and all the rest of it. Um, but the jump from that to uh, artificial general intelligence, where they decide to play a completely different game, uh mm. what, you know that that's that's uh, like a, a, a like a it's, shift. it's a huge yeah it's yeah. a huge jump it's a huge jump but i think that's because it's it's it, it we shouldn't see it as a jump we should see it as a very long way down a road mm. which we have to go it's a continuum you know it it's a bit like you know it, people were were didn't like evolution theory because uh you know the missing link and how can you go from this you know to us well, because it's a gradual thing, you know, we evolve slowly and, and complexity builds up. I think with consciousness, we're going to find it's a similar sort of thing. It doesn't, it doesn't suddenly, uh, uh, you don't suddenly get to artificial general intelligence where they're thinking in the same way that, you know, we mm. think. But you can always imagine them, um, you know, reaching a point that's the same as some simple insect that, uh, that, that, uh, or a worm that you know that f that if this then that if this happens i got to go food, find food over there if that prey comes i i disappear it's genetically sort of built in mm. that it has to follow certain procedures mm. um you can imagine uh, um, artificial intelligence reaching that stage well if it can reach that stage after all the worm and the insect are part of the tree of life and there's nothing magical that happened between them and us just a long time yeah then, then i think it's a similar sort of similar sort of argument yeah so it's just basically the time is is the only limiting factor to, to yeah. what and, we all... and and we and, and and most ai uh, researchers i think today would agree that we will at some point you know ais will will achieve artificial general intelligence they'll be as clever as us and very quickly surpass us what they argue about is when that will happen Mm. Uh, you know, the most optimistic will say 10, 20 years. The most pessimistic will say a thousand years. Uh, the average, which the majority on the bell curve sit, is probably maybe the end of this century.
Wow. So we haven't got to worry about it yet, but we should, (laughs) we should blink and well start thinking about it seriously. You you do not, you do not want the Terminator, right? (laughs) Well, yeah, exactly. And where everyone just thinks of the Terminator, it's like, we're, we're so inefficient. We, we take up all the resources, you know, if we're we're programming for a healthier, cleaner society, then the, the, the obvious option is to to get rid of the polluting humans. So that's where you get the idea of the Terminator. And, you know, I'm thinking about it through the, the, the lens of a physician. So already we're seeing AI in so many different ways. So pattern recognition, looking at MRI scans, when mm. I'm in A&E, for example, that would be incredible, you know, to have something that is almost like a fact checker. Um, we, we see it in skin uh, pattern um, uh, consumable tools that people can take pictures of the mole. So I, as a GP, don't have to look all over their body, you know, get them in every three or six mm. months. And then we're also seeing logistics as well, where we can actually pattern recognized such that we can predict when your ECG machine needs new paper or needs maintenance or your mm-hmm. endoscopes prevent them from breaking down. What, what I, what I'm, um, I wouldn't say I'm concerned about, what, but what I'm, um, I'm very interested in to, is to see is whether computers can actually take over the role of a, of a physician. What, what do you think about that? I think it's a huge ethical minefield um you know uh, the similar example is with driverless cars you know if we can have driverless cars that can you know t- they scan the road they know what's happening they're very safe as soon as driverless car runs someone over there'd be an outcry the fact that they might have reduced road accidents by 90 plus percent we tend to ignore well it's okay you know for for human to to to, to run someone over as human error mm-hmm. But don't get a machine to do it because you know somehow it's it's different. So I think we do have this concern that AI is uh, 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 we don't want it to take over because it you know, loses the human touch. It's almost a it's a it's a sort of somewhat illogical really to 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 think about it in that way. But I mean to give you an example, very recently I remember hearing a talk from uh, Zam Van Tulken, you know, the, the Van mm. Tulken twins. So Zam was at the, at the, um, um, the science festival um, and he was talking about, um, I don't know, I think it was part of a BBC Horizon that, that he presented a few years ago, but there, there was a study in America where they're looking at people who um, attempt to take their lives uh, and, 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 and don't succeed. And of course, then they go to therapy or they go, they go to their doctor and you know, how do you as a, as, as, as a physician or psychiatrist predict the likelihood that they will try and try again to take their mm. lives, you know, and you've got to take into account their state of mind, their environment, you know, their, their medical history and, and, and so on. They, they developed this AI system that could take in so many of these factors so quickly and, 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 and analyze them so much more carefully than a human could, and it reduced the the uh, um, probability of uh, reattempting to the, the, the many of these patients to reattempt to take their lives by a huge amount. So mm. it was saving lives, and yet, you know, understandably, we feel very uncomfortable of having a computer decide on whether to section someone or whether to say no, you can go back home, you're you're okay, sort of thing. And so that's those sort of decisions about. About we don't we're not we're a long way from from being ready to hand over responsibility for our health for our lives the lives of our loved ones to a machine. You yeah. Know, even I, th- even though logically it's 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 much more reliable than a human. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think this is a generational thing because the, the more I see, I don't know what they're called now. Is it Gen Z? Uh, right. Gen- yes. I, yeah, <laughs> Gen- I don't know. I'm I'm I'm, a, yeah. I'm sort of boomer, so I've got yeah. no idea. <laughs> I just scraped into the millennial bracket, so I'm I'm, I'm going to keep to that. So um, I, I mean, I I, I witness uh, you know um, the, these these young people coming in, they're, they're constantly on their phones. That everything they know is uh, through the medium of the internet, particularly uh, over the last year and a half as well. So I think we're we're, we're naturalizing into. An environment where computers play a huge, huge role, um, and some people that I've spoken to would feel quite um, comfortable with having a, a diagnostic tool that is powered by AI. And I, I think there's going to be almost like a transition period where we use computers almost like an Iron Man suit, where you know it can help me better yeah. detect someone's uh, blood results if it's reviewed, and then I also do another yeah. pass. 
through the, the results as well and deliver the results with, with that sort of added security. I and then maybe so. at some point down the line, there will be a complete takeover almost. Yeah, I know. I think I think absolutely that's what's happening. And in surgery as well, sort of robotic, mm. you know, AI is controlling robotic surgery procedure. But you need a human there. You want a human there as well <laughs> at the same time. But, you know, you're right. You know, we're already used to AIs on Netflix telling us what what film yeah. we probably want to watch next. You know, oh, yeah. So it, was, it scanned it scanned my uh, viewing history and decided these are the sorts of films I like. And sure enough, you know, so we, we are starting to take these AIs that are chugging away in the background, whether it's social media, whether it's um, um, somewhere or you know, something on the internet, uh, whether it's to do with you know, health and medicine, and it's, it's happening. And it's remarkable how quickly mm. we, you know, even those who haven't grown up in, in, in the, 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 internet, uh, the internet generation, it's remarkable how quickly people do just accept Mm. The, the, these new technologies that are coming at us so quickly you know who who'd, who'd have thought 20 years ago we'd be walking around with iphones now yep already in the last decade or less you know it's become normal that we, we've got a pocket supercomputer that used to be just in you know you could only see it in star trek <laughs> yeah yeah and i think you know with, with the with things like Neuralink and and all the other uh products that uh people are thinking about in terms of inserting the, the internet and they're having the capabilities mm. of all that knowledge. I mean, it's, it's exciting and, uh, and scary. And, and scary. And, yeah. But, but, but it, but again, you know, it's, it's, it's a progression from, you know, wearing glasses. I'm, yeah. I'm this is technology to enhance my, my, my natural, you know, phys physical abilities. Um, uh, yeah. So, uh, or, or, you know, if you have a replacement hip or knee, you know that you've done something intervention so why not intervene somewhere in, in in the brain that's part of your body as well it's just that it's you know these things always take some time to for us to sort of get used to it think no okay no that's fine i'm used to it now it's okay yeah yeah i mean having a pocket computer i mean everyone's got access to the internet right now and it's just a very short jump to okay well maybe i'll put stick it in my glasses. head <laughs> yeah so i'll just put it in my head and that now i can just and then the communication as well i mean yeah, yeah 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 um talking of the future so you're 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 still very much involved in uh academia i mean you've got a student uh coming on after this that you're going to be uh, having yes. a chat with um what, what are you working on now well um i've got a number of PhDs. So about you know five to ten years ago, I really thought my 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 days of doing academic research in theoretical physics were sort of coming to an end because I was doing a lot of TV work, um, radio work, and and you know sort of acting as a sort of science communicator. I still teach. I was. I mean, I've I've taught undergraduate physics students at the University of Surrey now for an unbroken stretch of twenty nine years. Wow. Now, normally academics take these sabbaticals every few years right to go off and take <laughs> but my life has been a sabbatical because I you know I, I teach but I go off gallivanting to, to do documentaries and so on so I haven't felt the need to, to for that break but in recent years I've I've, I've got back more in, in involved in research and and quantum biology the subject of the book that I wrote with John J. McFadden uh, life on the edge is very much our our area of research and actually as we're recording this this podcast, even though I, you know it won't go out just yet, but as of now in in mid June, uh, we I've just been awarded a large research grant uh, from an American charity worth three million dollars to wow. to to work on exactly the stuff that we're talking about. What is the connection between the quantum world and the classical world? How does the quantum become classical? What is the, what's the nature of measurement? What is the nature of time? I mean, that's the, 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 the title of the project is the arrow of time. You know, we are conscious of past as being distinct from future. There's an asymmetry there, you know, time is not reversible. Mm. In space, things are reversible. I can walk from A to B, but I can get back from B to A but I can't go from today to tomorrow and then come back to today again. So where does that irreversibility of time come from, given that at the fundamental level, the laws of physics don't have an arrow of time, everything is reversible. Uh, and so this is a big grant, which involves multiple institutions. Surrey is leading it, but we have you know, Oxford and Bristol in the UK, three universities in the US, uh, UC, UCLA, UC San Diego, um, Arizona State. We have physicists, chemists, mathematicians, philosophers, uh, um, uh, you know, all, all looking at different aspects of how the quantum world becomes the classical world and what its implications are to life 
and 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 the nature of time you know so exciting stuff i I, I suspect i'm going to be very because i'm because i'm leading on it that also means i've got a big admin responsibility as well <laughs> yeah. so i suspect you know whether i'll have time to to you know go off as and when i want it's probably you know less likely over the coming years but push comes to shove that is my my job i know you know a lot of people know me say from presenting a life scientific on radio four mm. but actually the day job is as a quantum physicist <laughs> so that's, i'll carry on doing the radio stuff but I'm, I'm also doing my research that sounds amazing i can totally see a documentary coming out of this as well particularly just with that roster of all the different yeah, specialties absolutely. philosophers well, well, physicists. we've sort of half promised the charity who's funding this because they said what's going to come out of it and there's mm. a big outreach um part to the research uh and I, i've sort of hinted that you know um I know a few exec producers for TV who would who would who would um, put a proposal together to send this in a documentary. Who who funds it is another matter. Maybe Netflix or Amazon Prime or you know. <laughs> so they yeah, got more money yeah. than the BBC. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I I would and I would love to watch it being uh, done in it live as well, like building this in public. You know, going through the whole thing and and you know doing a YouTube channel of it and actually uh, doing like weekly or monthly stints where you're like, this is where we're at at the moment. Ooh. This is the next step. You know, I think that would be fascinating. Good idea. I'll, yeah. I'll, 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 I'll take that. I'm just going to write that. that down Please do idea. that. Honestly, I would love that. I, th I think building in public these days is, uh, is the new medium because we're very um we're quite voyeuristic i think as, as humans we, mm. we love that's why like social media and instagram stories and all that kind of stuff is taken off because we are inherently so curious about how that how other people do things how other people live and i think with a project like that it would be incredible to see the journey unfold and i think you'd, you'd see a lot of people interested yeah definitely worth thinking about thank you <laughs> <laughs> awesome well this has been fascinating thank you so much um for for taking time out your busy schedule um uh, like i said i i listened to radio four it's uh, I, i've watched uh, your ted talk and some of the uh, the lectures that you've given at the royal institute as well they're absolutely fascinating um and it's uh, yeah it's been it's been brilliant well thank you very much i've enjoyed the chat <laughs>